Give me one second. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm counting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go. All right. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, today with us Dr. Saad. Dr. Saad is uh, a College of Science and Technology Distinguished Professor with the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the <coughs> University of Minnesota. He received uh, his degree, a doctorat d'état, uh, from the University of Grenoble in France in 1983. He joined the University of Minnesota in 1990 after actually uh, uh, a lot of experience uh, from different uh, places, such as uh, uh, Yale, Berkeley, uh, University of Illinois, and the Research Institute for Advanced Computer, uh, Computer Science. Uh, his current uh, interests uh, span many uh, different areas, including numerical linear algebra, sparse matrix computations, iterative methods, parallel computing, and data mining, which is, I guess, the topic of today. Uh, he's the author of two monographs and uh, uh, over 160 journal articles. He's uh, the in, in initial developer and co-developer of several software packages for solving sparse linear systems, including SparseKit, PARS, and ITSOL. Uh, he's a fellow of SIAM and a fellow of the double, uh, AAAS. Uh, for those of you who actually I've done any numerical linear algebra. I don't think uh, he needs any introduction. So it's a pleasure and to have you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's especially a pleasure giving the temperature in Minneapolis right now <laughs> to break from that. Minus 12 probably this morning. So. Anyway, so I was going to be talking about uh, is some uh, uh, work I've started doing uh, just uh, uh, a few years ago, actually. So my my own, I'm not really a specialist of this area per se. So I should tell you that this is just something that I'm getting into in the last few years. Uh, so just a few f facts that probably some of you may have, se have seen these numbers. It's really staggering. If you look at the uh, uh, data uh, that is where getting these days. It's growing exponentially. The term that you see is exponentially. It's exploding. It's an alarming rate, etc. So 90% of the data in the world today has been produced in the last two years. And uh, every year we produce uh, 2.3 million terabytes. It's a mixed blessing. You have a, a, a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of big challenges there. And of course, this has to have some effect on what everybody does, right? You do research. You have to take this fact, this trend into, uh, into uh, account. In particular, it's reshaping a lot of uh, different areas. In particular, in particular, my own, which is numerical numer algebra. A lot of us have, uh, uh, have worked on solving linear systems of equations, for example, coming from computational free dynamics or, or some uh, model problems like that. Now it's, it's going to be more data, I think, that you will see more of that. Okay, so what is data mining? Uh, it's a set of uh, tools and methods for extracting meaningful information from data. And it's a very broad area, uh, data analysis, machine learning, pattern recognition, information retrieval, all of these are subfields. Uh, the tools used are obviously near algebra, statistics, graph theory, approximation theory. It's really very rich in, in tough uh, tools that are exploited. Uh, this talk would be really a brief introduction. So it's, it has an introductory nature. And the, the emphasis would be on linear algebra, linear algebra viewpoint. And uh, I will emphasize especially the uh, dimension reduction aspects. And essentially, the talk would be really, a, 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 an alternative title of the talk would be linear algebra methods for dimension reduction. Okay, So this is really a focus. Uh, it would be a dimension reduction. So this person here is, is uh, 
rounding in data, I think, and he thinks he needs a uh, dimension reduction. Let's see what that is. Uh, uh, the goal of dim dimension reduction is not as much to really reduce the size of the problem. It could be, it could be uh, of course, a secondary aspect of it, but it's also to reduce the redundancy and the noise in the data. And you have, when you have lots of data, there is, uh, it's very likely that there's a lot of redundancy, there's a lot of noise, and you want to take that out. And doing dimension reduction has the effect of, of reducing that effect. If you try to just think of uh, plotting a, a, the analog for people doing just numerical analysis where, like, uh, for example, approximating functions, if you have a function with a lot of wiggles, if you approximate it exactly, uh, if you interpolate it exactly, you get uh, a terrible uh, result. But if you do it in this square sense, then you take rid, get rid of all the noise, and, and it gives you a much better result. So that's essentially uh, one of the uh, guiding factors. Uh, so the problem is the following. You, you have a, you're given a matrix here, X, which has columns in it. And each column corresponds to a sample of some data. And you have N of these. And they are in RM. So it's N vectors of size RM. And this could be, for example, pictures which you have uh, re reduced into one-dimensional vectors. So you, you write them as vectors. And you would like to find a representation, a low rank dimension representation of this data here. So X, each XI here would have a representation uh, YI. And that's much smaller dimension. So you go from RM to RD. And that's the, you have a, 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 represent, a certain function that achieves that. And sometimes you have that function explicitly, meaning that you actually have a, a, like a projection, for example, or, or explicit mapping that gives you, it gets you from XI to YI. Sometimes you just have the XIs and the YIs. So these are two different uh, possibilities. OK. So here's a, a picture representing that. You have these, uh, these uh, XIs here, and you have representations YIs. And you put this in two matrices, so it's n by n, and then this is d by n. And in the, list, in the simplest case, where you have a, a linear mapping, so y is of the form, every yi would be of the form w transpose xi, where w is certain matrix of size, well, m by d in this case, uh, sorry, d by m in this case. Uh, w transpose of size d by m. So you'd have the right dimension d for each vector here. So you write it in this form. So it could also be uh, nonlinear, meaning that you don't have an explicit mapping in that case. We'll see some examples like that later. Uh, so what do you ask of the function of this mapping phi? You can ask, for example, to preserve proximity. You would, would, li would like to, it to require, uh, you would like to, uh, if points are close by in the original space, you want them to be close by in the uh, target space. We can also try to see, uh, you know, try to maximize variance. If you have a, uh, well, you don't have a projection in this case. You cannot do it in this, on this system. But if you, have a, if you try to project this pen, for example, uh, on, the, on the 2D plane, you wouldn't project it this way, project it this way. Because you want to capture the original uh, picture, right? You're in the, uh, the original elements. And in order to do this, one criterion you could use is maximize variance. Say, well, I would like to maximize the variance of the uh, uh, data that's projected. So here, this is, th doing this, you get what is called principal component analysis, and uh, many of you know this. Uh, so what you have is you're now writing, sorry, you're writing the, your uh, data in this form, where W is, you ask of W to be orthogonal. You want an orthogonal mapping. Uh, but you want to minimize the, you mean to maximize rather, to maximize the variance. So this is exactly the variance of the projected data. And you work out the linear algebra, it just takes a few lines, and you'll end up with this problem. You'll end up uh, having to compute a W that is orthogonal, so it has orthogonal columns, such that this trace here is maximized. And this mu here is the mean. So this has to be maximized and then the, uh, the W is obviously uh, the set of eigenvectors associated with the largest eigenvalues of this uh, matrix here, and that's the covariance matrix. So that's a very standard technique, and it's very powerful, actually. It's simple as it is. You'll see if when you look at some examples of the digits, it does really a good job. So uh, then 
just looking at uh, defining this for people who do not necessarily know it, the, uh, the SVD, you, have a, you can compute the W also as a set of dominant, uh, of, of uh, left singular vectors of this uh, shifted matrix here. Uh, and the, sing the singular vectors are the vectors of this, uh, this left singular vectors are the columns of the matrix U you get from the SVD. So the SVD is simply a factoring of the matrix into an M by N matrix, say, into uh, a matrix that is di uh, diagonal. This has the same shape. The sigma here has the same shape as X, and U and V are orthogonal, so they are uh, unitary. So this is sort of generalization of, di of uh, the eigenvalue problem, diagonalization. So it has a lot of uh, a few other properties uh, that are also uh, uh, that characterize the uh, the PCA. So here's a uh, one one of the things you do with this. So this is a part of the uh, uh, data mining is, is in supervised learning. So you have data, and you would like to, just by very simple uh, means, like One, for example, projecting, zero, in projecting into 2D, uh, probably working out the uh, microphone. Uh, so just looking at the uh, uh, projecting in 2D, as I was mentioning earlier with the pen, trying to see if there is, a, uh, there is some sort of clustering of the data. Is a, like a, can you picture this data in a sort of, uh, can, do, you have, do you observe pieces that are together, pieces that are not together? There's some nice examples also of uh, uh, where you uh, observe some manifolds in high dimensional space. We don't, you don't see how the data looks like, but if you take, for example, uh, just d digits, you know, handwritten digits that tend to cluster naturally. There are some pictures, if you take pictures, a video, of like a, a teapot, you know, it's different videos. There's a, a nice example of this in some papers that you see where you have a pictures of the teapot at different angles. And you say, let's, let's see if I can uh, take those pictures together and plot them in 2D. And you will see exactly they come, ba come back in a circle, one next to the other in a certain angle. So, one, so you get uh, the right, the, you will get exactly the right ordering of the teapot. So it's just like a manifold in high dimension, and you plot it, you see it in 2D. It's very interesting to see that. So this is one thing that the people are interested in, just trying to see if there is any cluster. For example, these are digits five of seven, handwritten digits. I will show you examples in a second. And you, you will see that the five, six, and seven cluster nicely here. But this is just PCA, actually. OK. And then, would, of course, you would like to do something like this for materials. You have a bunch of. Uh, uh, data of materials, and we'd like to project that in CD, see if there is any, any uh, uh, clustering of the different materials. Like we'd like to have to see these are semiconductors, these are super hard, etc. So here's a very simple toy example. This is a picture in 3D generated by just one, two, two lines of, of MATLAB code, actually. And you project it in, in, uh, in 2D. So the, from 3D to 2D, it's not a big deal. This is what you get. You get this different projection. This is PCA, and this is a, a well-known uh, nonlinear mapping of a map, and this is something we worked on, and this is another method. So these are just different projections. You can see that the, the points now are projected, staying next to each other. Eigen maps and this, some of these, these nonlinear methods tend to have thin descriptions of the, of the and it's interesting to see how we, why you have this shape, but that's the way it is. How no, here's now a, a more interesting example. We have handwritten digits. These are, uh, we have 390 of these, uh, and they are uh, 39 for each digit. And, and you try to see if there is a clustering of this if you put that in 2D. And here's what you get. These are similar methods to the ones I showed you. Uh, this is PCA again. It's not very, this is digits only for 0 to 4. It's uh, some clustering here, but it's not very good. You know, this one is a little better. Uh, and then this is one of our, our one methods here. This is kernels. So this it gives you an idea of the kind, the kind of things you can get. This is, turns out that these digits are a little harder to, to cluster. It's not really so simple. You will see why, because they, it's very hard to distinguish even, even with the human eye between these, two, these digits. Okay. So here's now supervised learning. So in supervised learning, what you do is try to uh, use exploit data that you have that is labeled to get some uh, information about to rec for recognizing an item or classifying it, okay? Uh, so for example, an, a good example would be uh, the example of spam uh, email. So you could take, you, could, you have some email, you have lots of emails that you have classified by hand before, 
and you say now, is this new email spam or not spam? And you have a way of classifying it A or B. So, and the question way to do that is, uh, there are a lot of methods to do that. And so simply use some of these non, uh, uh, supervised learning methods using projections and so on. You reduce that in, in, in lower dimension and get the closest item. So we'll see examples in a second. Here's now uh, w the example of recognizing digits. <coughs> this is, you have a, a, a set of, uh, this could be digits, it could be faces, uh, pictures of, fa of individuals, they could be fingerprints, it could be a lot of different uh, items which you would like to recognize. So you have a, a number of digits here. For example, I'm showing here four samples for each digit and you'd have therefore here 400 of these. This is called training data, which is what you will use to recognize uh, a digit that's given to you. So now, this is known. You have the labels for these. And you get a digit that comes in and you say, which, uh, which digit is this? Is it a zero? Is it a one? Is it a two? And you have, by comparing with this. You could do something very simple by just taking uh, inner products or taking closest distance. Okay, that's, simp that's simple enough. Uh, you, can, you could do slightly better, I'll show you in a second. Uh, and then one thing you could do also is to reduce the data, dimension of the data. You go from here, reduce everything into lower dimensional data. That, you know, remember that with doing that, you're, you're essentially capturing the most important features of this data. And then you do the comparison in this space instead of doing it here. That does a good job in general. You will see now, actually, I'm going to go next thing here. Yeah, so the, um, before I go to that, so here's an inter uh, the one method you could, you could use, which is very popular in statistics. <coughs> you have a, uh, you just take some measure of distance. You have, uh, these are labeled points. And then you'd like to recognize this item here. So you, you take you, the K nearest neighbors. You decide on K, K being, for example, let's say 10, 10 or 15. So let's take the, the, the 10 closest items, and I will take the majority rule. The majority meaning if, if I take the, uh, in this case, this star here is represented four times. This one was only two, and this one is only two. So it's very likely that this is a star. Okay, so that's the, the argument, the statistical argument, saying uh, it's, it take the majority among the, the k nearest neighbors of the labels that you find. And then it gives you, you assign that label to this point here. So I have actually not started my lab yet, so let me slide that. Okay, so I'm going to show you this this picture. This picture is here, and actually I'm going to be on in front of the thing. So let's how about here? So oh, this has uh, some digits in there, and you can see what, what's in there. You have a so this is the uh, what you have is x, which is the vectorized version of the digit. This is the original data the date that. And this is x has all the, ve the vectors, and each, um, each column would be uh, a digit. And it has a 16 by thir thir 20 by 16 pixels, so it's 320 items in it. It's zeros and ones, it's very simple. Uh, and then the labels corresponding to that. And we have 39 per digit, so altogether 390. So now I say I have a, a few lists here of, of, of digits. Uh, these are, this is item number two from the data, and, uh, yeah, item number 71, et cetera. And if I, if I want to see these samples, here it is. This is like a, looking at, for example, sample number two, x, and then, uh, no, x, sample two. And this will show you the six, the six items. <coughs> oh. All right, somewhere here. There you go. So you can see uh, this is... Zero, one, that's a two. It doesn't look like it too much. And this is a, a four. It could appear like a nine. Then you have a five and then you have an eight. <coughs> the question, how do you recognize these? All right? What do you take, what do you do? What we do now is take, do the following. We're going to remove these this six items from the data. So we have 384 left. We have 390. We have 384 left. And we'd like to compare each of them to the other ones to see where it belongs, whether it's a zero, we don't know that uh, this ones are not supposed to be labeled now. We don't know them. 
So is that a zero or what number is that, etc.? So you could do the technique that I showed you now, this one here, uh, this one here. It, it's called KNN, so let's try it. Test KNN, and I will give just the data, labels, and uh, sample two. And I have to give you the number of neighbors. So I'm giving it the, the uh, data, labels, the uh, sample, and the number of labels, let's say 15. So it takes, for every item, it takes the 15 closest neighbors, the Euclidean distance, simply, and it takes the majority of the labels it finds there. And here's what you get. So and it, what it shows here, it shows the closest that it found for 0, closest it found for 1, etc., and then the next ones, the next closest one, closest ones, to see, get an idea. But what matters is the answer is right here. So it made three errors out of six. Could take slightly less, fewer points just to see. You can get it to about two errors, not no more. But that's it. You cannot go beyond this. Okay, so that that's essentially what you could do with this. But now let's suppose I use uh, SVD. So now this what they do. What they do now is uh, do the same thing that the SVD approach. They, uh, I will explain what the SVD approach does. So I'm going to take the same number ten. So what SVD will do is we'll project everything in, in this case, dimension 10. <coughs> so from 320, we have now each item is represented by a vector of length 10 only. So it's, it's much shorter. <coughs> 300, and then you do the comparison between that item you have with the, the, all the other ones, which are in, in this low dimensional space. And that does a lot better. You can get it actually to zero in this case. I looked around the numbers. Uh, uh, sorry, eight, you can get to no errors at all. So the, you recognized all of them by this simple PCA technique, okay, whereas with KNN you couldn't do that. So I'll come back to this if I have time to illustrate some of the other methods, but it gives you an idea of what we do. You project first, and then you do a comparison with the lower dimensional space. This, this technique <coughs> is used uh, as well in uh, uh, LSI, latest cementing indexing for information retrieval, and it's used for face recognition. Uh, it's used for a lot of other things. It's very similar techniques, right? S similar uh, kind of projection idea. Okay. So this is now uh, looking now at the li linear uh, discriminant analysis. <coughs> what this does is uh, it's an old method which tries to cl classify things by linear, but trying to find uh, find the linear hyperplane that separates items. So you just simply find a linear hyperplane, and then what you do is try to determine whether this is on this side or the other side by just taking in a product, for example, with the, with the orthogonal. Very simple. OK, so uh, here's a case where it won't work, of course. This is not, you cannot separate this by a hyperplane. You have these two, two sets. Oops, uh, I'm too fast here. Mm -hmm. this, this set here, the blue set and the red set, cannot be separated by a hyperplane or by line in this case. So what you do is uh, there is a, a technique that is used a lot for this, and that is to do use kernels. So you modify, you go in a it's also hard high dimensional space, and then you modify this by using kernels. By essentially, what essentially you do, what you essentially do is define inner product differently. So instead of taking the usual inner product being the uh, usual Euclidean inner product, you now take a, something much more complicated. For example, you can take a, a, an inner product just a Gaussian. So you take the x and i represented by e to the power minus x minus y squared divided by some scalar, by some sigma. And that has essentially no, no longer linear. Then once you replace the inner product by this, then things separate nicely. And then this you can, and this is a technique that's used a lot. So even though something might appear simplistic to you as just too simple like linear, there are th techniques that are used to make them, uh, say, usable and practical by, by passing through uh, kernels. Especially this, this technique I'm talking about now, LDA, uh, it relies heavily on, on, uh, on kernels. But I will describe it with the, with, with the general sent, uh, setting of, of the usual inner product. So what, what does uh, LDA do? You, it, it tries to, it's probably better to illustrate with this picture here first. So what you do is project the data in, in, a, in, a, in low dimensional space by asking the following. 
you have your data that's labeled. You would like the label data of the same class that are labeled the same way. That's called the class. You want them to be close together, right? Each of them. But you also want them to be far apart, for you want their uh, centroids to be uh, as far apart as possible. So you have two criteria. One is uh, the, what is called the uh, uh, within scatter. So the within scatter, which is corresponding to each class, that has to be small. And the between scatter, which, is, which corresponds to uh, the measure of the distance between different clusters, that has to be large. In order to, uh, to define this properly, what you do then is, is define these matrices. This is the uh, between scatter matrix, and it uses only the centroids of each class. And this is exactly, it symmetrically characterizes essentially this uh, between scatter of the classes. And this one is within the, the within scatter matrix. If you think, if you take now, now a projection in, in 1D, if you project this in 1D, what you will end up with is, is this measures here. This is the, this measures, this is exactly a measure of the between scatter. This is, as you can see, it's like, it looks like a distance, uh, it's the distance between A transpose mu K, which is your projected centroid, uh, minus A transpose mu, which is the, uh, the centroid of, of the whole class. This is for each class. And you want this to be, of course, uh, in between scatter, you want this to be large. And you want this, which is the projected scatter of each class, uh, and it's like a weighted sum of the variances of projected classes. You want that to be large. And so what people said is, since you want this to be large and this to be small, let's just maximize the ratio. All right. So you maximize the ratio, and you'll end up with this generalized eigenvalue problem. And A is just an eigenvector. So that gives you a projector. So you define these two measures, and it gives you the projector. That defines it for the one-dimensional case. So you, you, you essentially you form these matrices. You form these matrices, and you, you solve a generalized eigenvalue problem for one eigenvector, and then you will find uh, that A, that eigenvector, and that's your projector. So this is for 1D. For, for, a more, uh, for higher dimension, what would be natural is to do something like this. So you, you maximize the trace, the ratio of the trace of U transpose SBU divided by the trace of, of U transpose SWU. U now is, is assumed to be orthogonal. And you, for example, you could say, I want a projector that projects in D dimension, in two dimension, for example, or three or K dimensions. And that, that's what you, you get. You get. You would like to maximize this. However, however people have not done this uh, for various reasons, one being that they, they, well, it was thought that it was expensive, difficult to maximize this. So they did instead, what they did instead was to maximize this, this uh, uh, number here, this trace. Uh, with a restriction, <coughs> with the uh, constraint that you transpose is W is identity. It's not the same problem at all. There, these are different problems. <coughs> and this gives you a generalized eigenvalue problem, just like before. Uh, then you, you have your, your U, col the columns of U will be uh, here, and you get your projector this way. So this is what's done in practice. But we looked at this carefully, and we tried to tackle this problem directly. And it turns out you could do that. So uh, here is what you, what, uh, what you we did. This was a, a work about three years back. So uh, let's try to maximize this. And you look you look at this trace, uh, the ratio of these two traces. Well, it's just a little bit of analysis to show when the, when there is no solution. It's not it's not very complicated. This has a, a finite maximum value in their very mild conditions, and the maximum uh, is unique up to three unitary transformations. Obviously, you can rotate the basis anyway. You get the same result. So. So now, consider this function here. <coughs> For a given row, you fix row, and you have, you, maxim, you try to look at the maximum of the trace of V transpose A minus row B, uh, V, where v, v is orthogonal. So this is a certain function row. And we call V the maximizer. Of course, V is defined again up to rotations. <coughs> and it turns out, if you look at this matrix uh, A minus row B, which we call G of row, uh, well, the, uh, the, the called the mu mu i of rho the eigenvalues. Then of f of rho is the, the sum. Oops, going the wrong way. F of rho is just the sum of the first 
uh, t eigenvalues, because it's maximum of the trace of this matrix, and it reached when v is a set of eigenvectors associated with the p largest eigenvalues, and, and those are exactly these eigenvalues here. So this is uh, to sum up the, se the first p eigenvalues. You can express this with a, differently with a projector, uh, and then actually we uh, we looked at uh, so this is just the trace of that projector times the matrix, but we looked at it differently from the angle of this uh, Cauchy, Cauchy integrals to define the, uh, the the projector, and we plug that inside in this formula. What you'll end up, we're going the wrong way again. We plug that in the formula. What you'll end up is with is this this expression here that f of rho is exactly this. Very simple expression. But uh, that allows you to view, uh, find a few things. For example, uh, you can find, you can take the derivative of this function. You can find its non-decreasing function. Uh, and it's also true that f, is, uh, f of rho is 0 if and only if rho is this uh, optimal solution that we're looking for, the trace that maximizes the, trace of the ratio of the traces. So now you can, you can uh, try to apply something like Newton's method. Well, you apply Newton's method, it turns out to be something very simple. It's a row is, the new row is a trace of V transpose A V. V now is, depends on row, that's times V transpose B row with, with the old row. <coughs> so it's a really fixed function of this, uh, it's like a fixed point iteration of this function here. And some people have looked at this from a different angle and they didn't realize there was a Newton's, that what they were doing is a Newton's approach. They observed that it converges very fast. And it turns out it takes just a few steps to converge because it's a Newton approach, essentially. And uh, it's not, you see that it's, it converges, uh, you know, it not, you don't have a problem with convergence. And it's very inexpensive because all you need now, you don't have to solve a generalized eigenvalue problem. It's a, it, it, for, a, for this, what you need is simply to compute the, eigenvalue, the p largest eigenvalues of uh, an eigenvector is associated with this matrix. And you could use a simple technique like Longshaw's for this. So I have to talk a little bit about Longshaw's just now. So the main thing is that you, you will have to compute the, uh, the set of eigenvectors here uh, associated with the largest, uh, with the p largest eigenvalues. And that you could do with Longshaw's. And then you repeat the process a few times, then you get your, your solution. And so this is comp to compare with solving a generalized eigenvalue problem when you're looking for p, uh, the p dominant eigenvectors. And it's more better justified uh, uh, also from the point of view of the method. So let me, so these are some of the papers I mentioned that had more or less a similar approach. And some of them are cre exactly the same, but uh, this one in particular shows one of the approaches, which is identical. And these are uh, some of the uh, other ones that are variants of this thing. Okay, now the Langshaw's algorithm, many of you may know this. If you don't, here is the uh, one slide uh, about it. It's a simply um, an algorithm that you could uh, view as a sort of a projection method for, the, for a matrix. You take an initial, uh, it's, a, it's based on a randomization because you take an initial vector which is random, and from there you generate a subspace which based on powers of A, and then you project the matrix onto that subspace. So it gives you, it captures the most important, because it's based on the moments of A, it captures the most important features of A. It's a very, very important tool, because it's, it summarizes essentially the matrix, in, in, a, in a, it condenses it uh, by a lower rank representation. And when I, think, uh, I say lower rank, you immediately think SVD. Well, it is true that you can also use it as a replacement to SVD. So it's, it's a nice tool for, in the sense that it's inexpensive, it's an inexpensive alternative to something like SVD. And I'll, I'll show an illustration in a second. So what, it, what does it do? You start with a certain vector, uh, V, a random vector, and you do a process like this. So A, V, V, J is your current vector, minus alpha J, V, J. Alpha J is the inner product of A, V, J with, 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 uh, with V, J. I have uh, probably forgotten what W is here. Yeah, d W is just A, V, J. So, and then you... Uh, you subtract uh, beta, beta j, which is the previous scalar computer times vj minus 1. That's a three-term recurrence that gives you the next wj. And then you normalize this, and then you get your, your, your next vector. So in theory, these vectors are orthogonal, it turns out. And uh, this is very much linked 
with this stitch uh, approach for orthogonalizing polynomials. It's essentially a procedure to uh, produce orthogonal polynomials, but with a discrete inner product. Implicitly, that's what exactly what it is. Actually, probably Langshaw's might have discovered it by his insight from the uh, knowledge of uh, uh, approximation theory, orthogonal polynomials. This is nothing but uh, a way of uh, getting orthogonal polynomials, sequence of orthogonal polynomials using a discrete weight. So anyway, so uh, the, once you have this, you have now a set of vectors, VIs, and you have a representation which is in the form of a tridiagonal matrix. The alpha j's will be the diagonal entries, the beta j's will be the co-diagonal entries. And you have a representation, uh, a good representation of the matrix uh, of rank, let's say, m in this case, which is tridiagonal. And you have a basis uh, for that subspace in which you're approximating it, the vi's. OK. So what I was talking about doing Newton here, uh, uh, we're doing three steps of, uh, so use that, uh, 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 Langshaw's to compute this by Use exploiting that projection. Okay, so I'm going the wrong way. All right, so I'm second here. Okay, now let's look at graph-based techniques. So let me check, check how much time I got here. We're leaving linear algebra. Sorry? We're leaving linear algebra. Well, we're staying in linear algebra. Hold on, not, not, quite, not, not quite sure. All right. So uh, Graph-based techniques are, are very interesting because they uh, essentially they capture the data by a graph and then you, you work with the graph as opposed to working with the data directly. So, but the graph, you still need to compute the eigenvalues of a graph Laplacian, so you don't go any way from linear algebra. Okay. So uh, what you do is the following. Here's an, here's an interesting uh, uh, approach. Take the data. Suppose I'm looking at the data that I had, the digit, the digit I have. I'm going to construct a graph that captures neighborness, they captures uh, like locality. So I, have a, I take a point, I look at all the neighbors of that point. Neighbors in the uh, nearest neighbors in, list in the, uh, some distance, uh, the uh, Euclidean distance, for example. And then you construct that graph. And now you would like to construct a projector that will do the following. You would like that graph to be preserved. So the, the data now is entirely forgotten. You only have a graph because you captured the neighborness, you kept the, this uh, neighborhood, uh, local neighborhood characteristics, you ca captured them in a graph, and you would like to have a projector here that, that, is, that does the, uh, that preserves the graph. But what do you mean by preserving the graph? That's how I'll define in a second. So you, you have the Laplacian, they have the Laplacian uh, of the graph, and you uh, now, uh, this defines the, as, as you probably know of this. For example, let's take the simplest case where we take WIJ is one. Yeah, they graph the theory called the agency matrix. Uh, w. Yeah, this is just the agency matrix, matrix but, matrix right, right, right this, this is just the agency matrix. Well, hold on, but yeah, the, the thing is that uh, you also add, uh, this is not the, uh, yes. I is also connected to I, it's not there. So you, you take away the diagonal, yes. but you add to it, this, this diagonal here yes. adds to the, uh, you, you add that to the, uh, the, so you take minus the AJCC matrix and you put D, D in front. But it could be also different weights. So, right. So let's, let's uh, uh, use this thing as a simple. W is not necessarily symmetric. It's not, no, W here is symmetric in this. Uh, well, if, well, if you take nearest neighbor, it's not necessarily symmetric because okay. you go from the other point, not necessarily right. symmetric. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but if you take, uh, if you take things like distances, uh, you know, you, you can make it symmetric. It's not a... Uh, you can have a, uh, you can make the matrix symmetric by symmetrizing the graph, et cetera. But there's, there's an issue there with symmetry. Right? Yeah. Well, if you take nearest neighbor graph, if you take just this thing in here, it's not necessarily symmetric. Yeah. But if you take the k nearest neighbor graph, you may be, you may have a problem. Yeah. Correct. All right. <coughs> so here's the uh, what I mean now by representing the graph. So what you take, uh, let's look at, at uh, this graph Laplacian. You have WIJs now that are defined from the graph, from the, uh, the graph Laplacian. And one of the methods, for example, it's called the eigenmaps, is to say, I'm going to project this in my uh, low dimensional space such that the projected data, the YIs, are small, are, uh, uh, s small when the original data is small. We have XI minus YI here. That was the original data, right? That's, those are neighbors. So when those are, are, are small, it means that 
uh, that you have Wij, which is equal to 1, because they're, they're your nearest neighbors. So you want to essentially minimize this. And that, that will allow you to preserve this, this uh, uh, neighborhood characteristic, because when, when these are close by, these are going to be close by by, by minimizing this. So there are other uh, criteria that are used. In particular, so by the way, this leads to, if you minimize this, then you'll, uh, li you'll end up with an eigenvalue problem, which is size n by n. This leads you immediately to an eigenvalue problem uh, of size n by n. Uh, I, I'm not showing it here, but you will show for the next one. So now, the other thing that you could do is, instead of taking uh, uh, graph Laplacians, you take something called uh, similarity graphs, so affinity graphs, rather. This is the method uh, d defined uh, a few years back by, it's called LRE, which is very, uh, very powerful. Uh, what you do is you take, similarity graph is simply uh, a presentation uh, of a point from, with neighbors. So you take xi, and you represent it as a linear combination of, of the neighbors in the best possible way. That gives you some weights, all right? It gives you some weights. And, and those, now you do exactly the same thing. You can try to map the data into yi such that this is now minimized, okay? And that gives you, so in the, in the, in the uh, space that you're projecting, you will find uh, something that, that has the characteristic that the xi's are well represented with respect to neighboring. Uh, if, if xi is well represented with the neighboring nodes, then you have the same thing is observed on the projected data. That's what you, the goal. So I'm going to mention here something that uh, uh, you, you may have observed. Uh, there are two types of methods here. One of them were, gives you uh, an explicit mapping. Right? In PCA, we had an explicit mapping. And in eigenmaps in LLE, we only have this. We only have, we don't have to project the xi's to the yi's because we only have uh, eigenvectors that may have I missed to mention that. So the, this one here will give you a projector, but what you what give you, uh, sorry, give you yi's, okay? We only have the yi's, and these are in low dimensional space, but you don't have the, the mapping that goes from the xi's to yi's. It's some complicated mapping. It's not explicit in the form of a matrix product or something like that. Uh, so that's what you have here. Whereas in the PCA, you have that explicitly, w transpose times x. So uh, that is the distinction between these two approaches. These are tend to be uh, referred to as nonlinear. So it's really because the mapping is obviously nonlinear, but it's also not explicit. Okay, so we, what we did was to try to uh, use some of these features of, of the uh, linear approach and the nonlinear approach to combine them together. So uh, we looked at this uh, thing called ONPP, which is uh, essentially exactly this problem here, the same as LLE, the same as, exactly the same as LLE. So minimizing this, same graph, considering the same way, but now the yi's are forced to be explicit mappings, so y is of the form w transpose x. So we, we force that explicit mapping from, from uh, x, xi to y. So now we do have the mapping and we're looking for that mapping. And that mapping it turns out, if you look at the algebra, it just uh, amounts to solving this eigenvalue problem here, minimizing the trace of uh, V transpose by this matrix by V, and that you have the original da data that comes in here. And then that gives you your, your, uh, your mapping V. You could use that for face recognition, et cetera. So I'm going to show you face recognition as an example. You can see some uh, a random, uh, randomly picked individual from North Carolina. Uh, is it some pictures here? <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, see, question is, you get another picture, and how do you recognize, uh, can you recognize whether this person is one of these, right? And there's another randomly picked individual from uh, North Carolina. Listen to them. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the, 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 you do exactly the same thing we did earlier which is to reduce this for, with digits. We did this exactly the same thing with digits. Took these, these uh, pictures, put them in, in uh, vertical vectors, and then you do SVD, project, and uh, try to uh, look at the closest item, okay? Very similar to the thing we showed you with the digits, and also similar to LSI, which is 
another technique for uh, text in, in text retrieval. OK. So for, for uh, we could also use graph-based graph techniques for in this setting, because now we have the data is labeled. So you have a, all those faces of the same individual have a label, and you put them as a clique. The, the, gra the graph becomes a set of cliques. Each, each individual will be connected to all the other ones. You could also look at inverse neighbors. Both approaches work actually fine. So, uh, and then you look at, at this, and here's what you get. You know, and that, by the way, there's more, one more technique I wanted to add. We also looked at uh, uh, adding something which is uh, like a repulsion. This is, you can get a lot of insight by looking at mechanics, right? This is, uh, you have one thing that trying to get forces that attract each other, and you have also to add, inc include a force to uh, repel items that are not the same, but are close by. What I mean by this is the following. If you take... If you take uh, points that are very close by, you, know, you have your KNN and neighbors, you have the K nearest neighbors here. And if you take points that are not near, uh, nearest neighbors, some of them will be in the right class. They are, everything here is labeled. You know the labels, right? Some of them will be in the same class, but some of them will be in the wrong class. So if you project that, it would be nice to have something that tells you that these are forced friends. You have to push them away. And by, you do that by putting, adding a term here, which is mi minus a Laplacian, <coughs> a graph Laplacian, corresponding to these false neighbors here. That does make an incredible uh, uh, difference in the, uh, in the recognition rate. And you'll see that. This is an example. I'll show you just one example from that paper. We have uh, this ORL uh, data set. It has 40 subjects, 10 sample for each, just like we had before, like 39 for each digit. Then you have 10, only 10 for each. We take half of them as training set, and the other half for uh, testing. So we take one picture at a time for testing. And th this, is, this is the number of pixels. The total number of images is 40 times uh, 10. So here's the result you get. And there's, there's a lot of methods here that are shown, so I'm going to show you. Uh, this, this thing here is Laplacian uh, uh, eigenmap, the La Laplacian faces. It doesn't do very well. Uh, essentially, this is PCA right here. And then we have Fisher, which is LDA, which I showed you earlier. That doesn't do very well either. It's somewhere here. And then you have uh, this ONPP, which we developed earlier, which is right somewhere here. And this is using with the, uh, using the repression Laplacian, adding this term that I just mentioned to you, adding this term here. So the same thing, but adding that Laplacian, uh, that repression Laplacian. And this is, does essentially the best. It's another version uses graph. This one uses uh, affinity graphs. This one uses graph Laplacian. So it's the only difference between the two. Recognition rates are pretty good, like 97%, close to 98%. For How do you this, pick a role? Sorry? How do you pick a role? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we, well in, the, in uh, the codes that I actually, I'm not sure I have, to, I could show you a demo with this, but you t pick it uh, after you uh, normalize everything to the, have the same weight. You Typically, not, not too different for 0 0.2. And then interestingly, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 give you similar results. Below that, this is really a, a simple observation from these data sets. But uh, we we'll also observe something interesting related to your question. That is that you can ask now the question, uh, you see, you can ask the question, what happens if you take the, uh, you optimize the ratio, the, the traces? Now, because we have, the, we have an optimal approach supposedly, which is optimizing the trace, traces. Well, that doesn't do as well as this, but taking an ad hoc row. And that raises the question, why is that? There's a stati statistical argument behind, which I don't quite get, which sh shows that minimizing the trace, which is the best you can do normally, is not necessarily the best uh, for the recognition. For, uh, statistically, it doesn't seem to be the best thing you can do. So this does reasonably well with, with, you know, with just an ad hoc choice. And there's certainly some uh, more uh, work to be do done to, to explore this further. <coughs> okay. So I think I'm not sure. Uh, let's see how much time here. You have ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to go a little faster. Uh, so the, this is simply the use of, of uh, long shots. I'll, I'll just go quickly here. Very simply th said, it's the following: replace the SV singular vectors by long shots vectors as they are. So you take a long cross with the orthogonalization to make the things orthogonal. 
And instead of using singular vectors, just use long shows vectors. And that's a lot cheaper. It's also, of course, this is the pre-processing pre phase, a lot cheaper than SVD. We we're using SVDS from MATLAB here. Uh, this is the, uh, what do you call the query time when you do the queries. This is a very small difference in the, uh, this is no, this is the really, uh, with re one of them is re with the, uh, relevance feedback, the other we without. But essentially, there's also a big difference in here. But the, the, the main thing is the recognition rate. This is with and without re uh, relevance feedback. The recognition rate uh, is, uh, I mean, this is, you look at Langshaus versus TSVD. So these are the two. And this is whether there is feedback, without feedback. And they're very similar. And if you look at the, the best ones you can get, they're actually close. The, even Langshaus, they're very, very slightly better, very, very similar anyway. So you could get the same results with using only Langshaus vectors as opposed to uh, uh, singular vectors. All right. Now look at, uh, looking at ST, uh, updating this, we did a lot of different problems uh, that occur because you, you have a different context now. You have, an S, uh, you have doing, for example, LSI. We look at the text information. The text the matrix itself changes all the time. The data changes. You have new data that comes in, and you have new uh, terms that come in, and you would like to update the SVD. And you, you can, of course, you have the option for starting from scratch, and you can, you can guess that it's not a good approach. So what do you do? There is a nice uh, method proposed a few years back by uh, Zah and Simon, which takes the following. You take, you take the SVD, and now you have this is of A, an approximate SVD of A. And now you have a, a new set of documents that come in. So now have, you have a new matrix, the old matrix plus a set of new documents. And you would like to get the SVD of this matrix. What you do, you project the D using the left singular vectors here, project out orthogonally, you get DK. And you do, you do a decomposition, QR decomposition of this. And you have an approximate, you have this thing. Now AD can be now factored this way. UK is the original matrix you have here. This is the one you get from uh, this QR factorization. HD is this matrix. And this is an orth uh, a matrix you create by use doing, putting the VK and then some uh, identity at the bottom here. So you create a uh, sort of an orthogonal matrix uh, artificially here. And then what happens, of course, is this, is an almost, this is almost an SVD. You just have to factor this using SVD. And you put the you multiply the factors, the orthogonal matrices to left and right, and you get your new approximate SVD. That's, so this is the approach that designed Simon. And it turns out that this is equivalent to a really reads uh, projection procedure, although they didn't see it that way. But it's, it's simply a really reads projection procedure where you have this matrix here, which is the new uh, projected uh, data, actually UK and D. What we did was to see that, in fact, uh, when you look at, uh, at this, and the, d the number of data items now starts increasing a lot. You have a new, uh, new data that comes in uh, frequently. The matrix has uh, changed, changed, si changed sizes a lot. And you, you see, how can you do better than this? The cost, com comes, uh, the cost of this factorization here becomes non-trivial. So it's an uncubed process. So you'd like to reduce that. And what we did was simply to project the UK further. It's really simple. Uh, intuition just to see that this is what you need to do. You do, you take the uh, singular vectors associated with the, uh, with, uh, with UK. And then you get, uh, well, the results that I will show you are, are just based on that. So this is an example with the Medline, which is a, 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 a one-known connection, a, a collection of 7,000 terms and 1,000 documents. Uh, and what we do is take, uh, you have 133 documents you take 53 of the, one, 533 of them first, you do the SVD of that, and then you add 25 documents every time, and see, so 25 at a time, and try to, to update the SVD. So it's really, you see what you got here, is you have the first calculation was done here. That's done once and for all in the beginning, and then you, you add 25 documents, you add 25 of them, all the, all the way to the end when you have all of them, and do the query. You have a query of 33, I think 33 uh, queries, and here's what you get in terms of uh, precision. <coughs> this, is the, uh, this is the method with the, 
using SVD, we're adding just two vectors at a time, we're using projection and adding two vectors at a time. This is using, using uh, Golub Kahan long shots algorithm. So this is, again, the same spirit as what I told you earlier with long shots. And this is the Zas Simon. Zas Simon, which is more expensive, uses more data, gives you less accurate results. So that's essentially, you might ask the question why. It's the same principle of uh, using you know, less data. By using less data, you're getting less noise in the system. So I think it's explaining it, but it, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to uh, explain that statistically. Why do you get this thing? But it's, it typically, this is a common observation, always better. Use less data in this case. Less more. Less is, with less <laughs> you get more, exactly. And here's uh, the timing now. Of course, you can, I could, uh, just the timing would show by simple analysis that it's more expensive to do it with the old, old way. This is a simple thing to see. I have a few minutes left for uh, what I, I wanted to talk about, materials. Uh, we have been, I've been doing this work with a, a collaborator from, uh, initially was at in, uh, Minnesota, and then he left, probably due to weather, I don't know, he went to Austin. So, uh, and then we, we kept collaborating for, for, uh, for a long time. And, uh, so one of the things we started doing at the end was to try to see if we could merge these areas of data mining with materials. So, but he, he's a physicist, so it's a totally different uh, world for him. And we looked, trying to look, it's very hard. I tell you up front that it's, uh, it's, we're having difficulty uh, for a number of reasons, one of them being data. So the question, I can, I can sum <coughs> some of the issues here. Of course, the, one of the biggest uh, uh, potentials here is to discover new materials uh, by just doing data mining. So you could say, well, let's look at this is, these materials have, these compounds have li good likelihood of being, for example, uh, semiconductor, or good semiconductors or strong, strong, component, so strong compounds or uh, so these properties. So you can, if you could do that, then you can do now a, a, a more uh, refined search doing uh, up initial type techniques or standard uh, materials type techniques, okay? So the problem is uh, there are some issues with uh, you know r this area because of the very few people are familiar with both worlds, and then there is the problem of databases. This is one of the things that we have confronted. Uh, this is uh, something that came from the NSTC report of the White House, uh, June 2011. This is uh, what started the Materials Genome Initiative. They, so they were critical of this thing. So the inherently fragmented and multidisciplinary nature of the materials community poses barriers to establishing the required network to sharing results and information. One of the largest challenges will be encouraging scientists to think of themselves not as individual researchers, but as part of a powerful network, collecting, and, uh, collectively analyzing and using data generated by the larger community. These barriers must be welcome. It must be overcome, sorry, <laughs> barriers must be overcome. And, uh, and in fact, you, you can, if you compare this to the world of computer science, where things are more open, it's a big diff it's a big challenge. You know, you can you cannot find uh, now it's changing a little bit. It's very hard to find uh, uh, data that's available uh, to everybody. People working on people tend to work really like uh, individuals with not sharing too much. So we looked at one of the problems that. Uh, uh, my collaborator worked on in the 70s. So they, they had these techniques for uh, trying to find coordinates to project data, exactly what we do in 2D, to see how they, how they separate them. So they have, a, for example, there's like a 70, I don't know how many, how many uh, compounds here. And this is a, a, a figure from the paper. And they, had, uh, they can separate them into little, uh, just exactly clustering, you know, by just doing a projection in 2D. They found here, when a compound which didn't belong, CUF, uh, and then they, they looked at it and they found that actually this, this could not be formed. This is not a not existent compound. So it's an interesting thing, but just looking at, at, da at data like this, you can infer something wrong in the data. And they, were turn they, uh, they uh, went back and they <laughs> discovered that it was not a, a good compound. So uh, this is uh, something we did ourselves with just using PCA, looking at exactly the same data and trying to see whether you could cluster it uh, by using this all of information. But using now only the, comp the, uh, the atoms, using the, uh, no, the you know, some of the number of valence electrons, 
ionization energy. These are numbers you can get from the, for the atoms. They are all very avail available. And here's what you get. This is something that's not too bad. You see, this is, these are the uh, uh, zinc blend, world size, diamond, rock salt, and then there's two things that are in between. And they do shun to the, the right things. And then we looked at classification. We, it was a very similar thing. I didn't want to spend too much time on this. We had some good recognition rates here for, for different methods. But now recently, we've been looking at, at uh, some data is becoming available. There's some uh, a site in, in, at MIT. Uh, this is thanks to the genome initiative, uh, material genome initiative. And you can find uh, things like these, for example. These are, these are uh, very well known in the physics community, materials community. These are what are called uh, uh, bench structures. So you can think of these. Now here is an interesting, challenging question. Think of these as pictures, like images. Try to do things like projection and see what happens. <coughs> All right, it's perfectly OK actually do that. We have, this is restricted what we did here to uh, a number of uh, compounds that uh, share the same structure. And here's what we found. This is uh, using three clusters. And it does really do quite well. You know, this is KNN using uh, some sort of technique here. It is compiled. We don't really know yet. Uh, we're still looking at this to see what happens in your end. What you can do, the most important part is not this. Uh, the most important part is to see uh, if you could do something uh, like classification, because that really would be uh, significant. If you do, you can find some properties by just uh, comparing them using uh, other things. It would be really a big, uh, big advance. So there are a lot of uh, new interesting problems uh, it, it involve, uh, it, they come from uh, effective use of data. Uh, among the most pressing issues, I would say, I think people have, have looked at this area, have not given, paid too much attention to cost so far, because they, they just wanted the method to work fast first. You know. And then cost is, is secondary. Uh, if something doesn't work, you don't want to worry about uh, reducing the cost. So that's becoming now uh, an important factor. There are a lot of resources available, uh, and a huge, there's a huge potential in, in areas that blend physics, uh, like, for example, materials with data mining. Uh, and then uh, I think there's some cultures that have to be, uh, you know, there's a lot of inertia due to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that the, some of these methods are not well understood by some of the communities out there. Now there's uh, materials genome starting to change things a little bit. Uh, we have uh, some data available. And so when I, uh, so to research in numeric, numerical algebra, when I, uh, 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 there's a big tide of change, and students really are, uh, uh, tend to uh, tell students that this is good for them. You know, they have to, they have to embrace these new areas. Uh, and I ha like this quote by uh, Alexander Graham Bell, one warm door closes, another opens, but we often look so long and so regretfully upon the door, the closed door, that we do not see the, the which it has opened to us. So there's a lot of new things coming. If, if, if you know this uh, book, Who Moved My Cheese? That's a very interesting book that's given to uh, uh, CEOs and so on to tell them that you have to, they have to embrace uh, the, you know, new change and they have to be very careful that changes, changes coming and you'll be, uh, you need to be proactive in, in uh, you know, uh, getting into the new, er new areas. And in their words, if you do not change, you can become extinct. <laughs> and the one I liked also is the quicker you go, let go of old cheese, the sooner you find new cheese. Thank you. We have time yeah. for a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. Just a quick question. Uh, you told us the Laplacian story. Uh, and uh, I was just waiting to see whether the Fiddler vector will fall out anywhere out of this discussion. That's all I can remember from that uh, area. Fiddler yeah, vector, yes, sure. Uh, is there but, a oh, place for it? Yes, uh, absolutely. In this? Yeah, right. when, you do, when you do things like clustering, uh, the Fiddler vector comes in as a, as a vector that you know, separates uh, classes naturally. So yeah, it yeah it's, it's hidden here. This is, this is actually the link that's used mo uh, most, is that vector. The, the, that link is, is utilized, yes, yeah, sure. But that is when the number of uh, classes, I mean, when the number of classes is relatively small, when it's a large, yeah. that vector becomes a problem. I, okay. Yeah, right. I was just curious because that's all I remember from yeah. this area. Yeah. <laughs> is it connected? It's still there. It's still there. <laughs> <laughs> it's still there. It's definitely there. Yeah. The uh, spectral eigenmicro projection, that is one of the axes. Yeah. It, 
used to be Arish, yeah? yeah. So this is obviously a very common problem and I want to see if you learned any new tricks from your experience. Um, so in Grashner's methods, how do you pick the size of the neighborhood? Oh, that's, uh, absolutely, that's a very important problem. Actually, you can get very different results if the yes. number of neighborhoods mm -hmm. are asked. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer to the question. I, you know, that's typically people just take, uh, uh, you know, they, they know that for a graph that's fairly dense, they, take, uh, they take, need to take la larger uh, numbers, that's all. The same thing, by the way, for dimension that you use. How do you speak the dimension? You know, there is a, a, this is one, one reason why long shows is so much better, because long shows gives you a sort of uh, weighted, uh, you know, you take, instead of taking 10, you could take a much larger subspace, but then it's, it takes uh, the first ones are, are more important, and then they have a, it's like a decay, uh, decaying accuracy towards the end. But it's some sort of averaging out. It's it's a little nicer if you use actually. Yeah. So in the case of images, your your pixels are all very highly correlated to each other. Can you, can you comment on the strength of these techniques when your your features for classification are uncorrelated with each other? Does it matter necessarily? Uh, is it and, uh, well, they're correlated to each other. To you try to capture that with uh, you know with, with graph uh, graph theory techniques. But in, in the, when you look at the PCA, it does essentially uh, essentially utilize the correlations. Yeah, I don't think you can get uh, all of these techniques that are. Uh, that's actually that the reason is that they want to go away from from just using a projection like uh, with rank low rank approximations. Questions? I have very one quick question. Sure. When you talked about the uh, updating uh, uh, SVD, SVD yeah. uh, is there any rule for uh, you know how, how how big of a block uh, uh, you use in your uh, in your iterative? Well, yeah, that's thing? a good. That's a similar question. We have the, the number of uh, the data that that you're getting the new data, the size of D. Right. Now you don't have control of that. You just have new new data that comes in. You can t t select to. To do it a few a few times, you know, depend on uh, the cost you want to pay. But then the the other one, which is important, is this, that ZL that we added to make the cost uh, smaller. That it's uh, for now we just like a small number, like two or three or four uh, new additional uh, singular vectors. That's all we do. But it, 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 all of these questions are really difficult to answer, you know, in like. Uh, uh, so there hasn't been any. Uh, no, there hasn't been any work in this, terms of it, theoretical. Uh, right, exactly. We know that it's better. At, uh, for the same thing, for example, with, the, with just PCA. You know that it works at certain point and then it starts declining. The uh, the accuracy starts becoming worse after a while because right. you're putting in the noise and, uh, right. and stuff like that. So uh, this is uh, something that has to be uh, looked at. You know. Very quickly, yes. No. Yeah. Professor, I have a quick question. When you talk about the, the repulsive Laplacian, right. um, how do we have to determine the clusters first, and then we have to uh, subtract the repulsive Laplacian? Yeah, we have we have the two the two Laplacians, right? There is one that corresponds to the classes, and then then that could one could correspond to the cliques. That one is based on the cliques, so it's a block diagonal matrix. And the other one is based on neighbors. You just take again k nearest neighbors, and you pick those that are not in the same class. And you, you form the Laplacian that way. Oh, yeah. You got it? Okay. All right. Let's thank our speaker again.